Gold's Gym. Today, Gold's Gym is considered the mecca of bodybuilding, and most people understand that this legendary and iconic gym was started during the golden years of bodybuilding by gym pioneer Joe Gold. But few know that Joe Gold was struggling with Gold's Gym, and that he sold it because although the best bodybuilders in the world were training there, it was a financial disaster. In this third interview with previous Gold's Gym owner Ken Sprague, we are going to look at how Ken saved Gold's Gym from the brink of extinction and turned it into the mecca of bodybuilding. So you've explained um, how you got to California, your uh, brief stint as a as a model, and um, now I know that this led eventually to you joining Gold's Gym. Um, yeah. Now, how was it that you actually just started training there? Was it the fact that you live close by or, you know, because I know Vince's was around, Bill's, Bill's gym was around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did live at the beach mm-hmm. and uh, Gold's was within all you know, three blocks of the apartment I had. Oh, I can. <laughs> it was funny. The <laughs> I had never heard of Gold's in Cincinnati, even though I was a bodybuilder and weightlifter. And I had never heard of Gold's. Mm-hmm. And the first, first time I went into Gold's, a friend at the beach says, let's go. I, I had been training at the outdoor weight pen. Okay. And a friend, and a friend said, let's go uh, try out Gold's. And uh, so I went over there with him and he says, now wait, we'll wait until the manager leaves for lunch. The manager, the manager was Zavo Kaziski. All right, and he, and he would take three, four hour hour lunches because he'd want to lay in the sun. He was, it seemed kind of lazy. Too. Yeah. So as Zavo came out the door and went one way, we came from the other direction <laughs> into the gym and trained. There might have been three people in at that time of the day. There wasn't anybody in there anyway. But yeah. that was my introduction into Gold's Gym, my first. <laughs> and so later I went ahead and joined up. And, <laughs> and then yeah, in 19... Sorry, Go no. ahead. I was going to say then in 1972, uh, I purchased the place on just as much of a whim. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken Waller and I were in there training together. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't known this before, but it had been for sale for the previous six months by the then owner, Bud Danitz. Mm-hmm. Joe Gold had lost money on it, so he sold it to Danitz. Danitz was losing money. Danitz was desperate to find a purchaser. So Waller and I are there training, and Danitz walks over to me. I think I was his last chance, candidly. But he walked over to me, and he, he said, uh, would you like to buy the gym? Otherwise, I'm going to have to close it in 10 days. And I said, you know, give me some time to think about it meaning that I'd come back the next day or the day after. Mm -hmm. I did some mental calculations, and uh, I said, Waller, if I buy this place, will you run it for me? Will you manage it? Because I didn't want to be stuck in a gym, really. I I had no aspirations to be a gym owner. And Waller says, sure. And so I walked over about 10 minutes after he asked me, (laughs) after Dan had asked me if I wanted to purchase it, I said, sure, I'll buy the gym. And uh, I uh, lined up some in, to him some basic parameters of the deal, asked his attorney to have it uh, written up and my attorney to okay it. And that was that. Why no one else wanted to buy it, I don't know. But uh, I know I had to create a sort of uh, different sort of package. I bought the entire corporation of Gold's Gym, meaning that with it came the gym business, the buildings, three and a half lots, which Danitz had purchased it with the thought, hey, one day this will be a big gym and I'll have parking. <laughs> so I bought out of that two buildings, three and a half lots, the business. Uh, I calculated that the lots and the buildings would escalate in value. I had purchased buildings in in Venice already, and I knew that uh, all that would escalate in value, and I didn't mind losing money in the cash flow along the way. So at least not too much money, but uh, everything worked out. 
And ironically, the gym made money right away. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I want to ask now um, before we continue, because this, this is rather a, a big part of your life, almost a decade, one could say. Um, you mentioned that, obviously, we all know that Gold's was uh, started by Joe Gold. Um, mm -hmm. But how long did he own it before he passed it off, off to Danitz? Because this is something I don't kind of... Yeah, no, it's very... You know, you hear Gold's jam, you hear Joe Gold, Joe Gold. You don't hear how it actually became famous. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, Joe owned it for four and a half years, and it was losing money, and he was tired of the... Uh, tired of the money loss and the uh, aggravation of dealing with the gym. And so he sold it to Danitz. Danitz was an antique dealer from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And there was another fellow, his friend, Dave Sachs, who lived in Venice and was a member of the gym. Mm -hmm. The two of them with uh, Danitz money purchased golds from Joe Gold. And they kept it for about two years yeah so and that was go ahead just to interrupt you because joe gold started the gym in 65 is that correct 65, late 65 yeah. yeah and he had it till about 69 70 yeah yeah okay. a little before 1970 just just and going then, through my mind chronologically okay please got continue. it <laughs> got it and then danitz uh purchased had it for about two years and okay. it was going under Danitz being an antique store owner also was going to close the gym. That's the 10 day deal. Yeah. <laughs> close the gym and move antiques into the building. Yeah. So there, had I not stepped forward, you know, I'm in retrospect, there would be no Gold's Gym today. Yeah. Had Waller not agreed, <laughs> there would be no Gold's Gym today. Neither, exactly. Right. Had my brother not started to be into weight training at 10 years old, there would be no Gold's Gym today. I mean, all those little pieces had to fall into place for it to, yeah. for there to be a Gold's Gym today. <laughs> now, I just want to ask about, I'm, I'm actually interviewing Ken Waller um, next weekend. I'm very oh, good. Um, you've mentioned uh, Zabo, and I recall, um, I forget who it was that said this, um, but they used to call him the chief. Yes, that's um, right. That's and when right. they asked what 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 he was the chief of, <laughs> who said this? They said he was the chief of nothing because he did nothing. Oh yeah, this is um uh oh good friend of mine. Um we also talk a lot. Oh god, how can I not Jerry, Jerry? <laughs> so Jerry told me this story. Uh, Jerry Brainham is chief oh. of nothing. <laughs> so, I want to ask now, I mean, Dabo seems like he was a very accomplished bodybuilder. Uh, John Ballack is another good friend of mine who uh -huh. you know very well, sent me a, a portfolio of of all his competitions and photos, and he was basically winning any, everything uh, back in those days. Mm -hmm. But going back to the original, you know, almost uh, the climb, and you saving golds was Zabo really that uh blase about you know with like such a carefree attitude that he didn't really care who came in, who came out i mean you guys snuck in right i'm just getting this vibe yeah. that he didn't really oh, no. if, <laughs> now don't get me wrong i liked him but he was absolutely worthless <laughs> that's my employee. point so so <laughs> here we have a comparison now and I come back to the 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 point of Ken Waller. When you asked Ken, you must have already known him that he was a responsible person. Why did you choose Ken? Exactly. I had met Ken in Cincinnati when I was a judge for the Mr. Midwest contest. Okay. And Kenny came into Cincinnati. I, I can't remember where he lived at the time, but uh, that's my first meeting. Uh, he grew up part of his life in Kentucky, which is the next state over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had some common interests and then we met out at Gold's and I could see the guy was a go-getter. He was yeah. hard, he was a college athlete. I mean, yeah. he, uh, whatever he said he was gonna do, you could count on it. He was an yeah. honest guy, I, I trusted him. Yeah. Anybody else in that gym, I wouldn't have uh, <laughs> bought the place if I had to rely on them. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. I I heard that a lot of the guys were, you know, no disrespect to them, to Zabo, to anybody, but yeah, a lot of them were just beach bums and trained and expected to train for free and eat for free. Oh, yeah. Whatever. yeah. As a matter of fact, we guys would come from Europe or from Eastern United States. They'd wind up sleeping on the gym roof or in the locker room or whatever. They had no money, no money, no, uh, no plan, no real plan. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why Gold's Gym wasn't really doing very well. Um, you know, it, it's just a, that's a good part of the reason. Yeah. Of course, it wasn't getting any media attention either. Yeah. Well, that's I what think, you come in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's how it, it helped. I had contacts in a lot of contacts in the entertainment industry. Hmm. Uh, of course. Well, yeah. that's my next question. I mean, with your experience as a model, with having done the film work, et cetera, the money you made, all of this, do you think all of this previous work um, helped with the acquisition initially, like financially with the acquisition of Gold's Gym and then its propagation? Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah. Had I not had the money, of course, I couldn't have bailed the place out. Okay. And as far as promoting the place, the contacts in the inter entertainment industry that I had developed, heck, I was having Sunday lunch with Catherine Hepburn and, and uh, wow. Gene Hackman, who's still alive, thankfully. Yeah. But um, uh, I think it, I knew the big PR people, I met the major producers, and so I learned a lot just observation as much as anything else mm. and it did help it helped tremendously to push the gym because first thing i said if you want to have a scene of a gym just come on down here you know you don't have to um no fee no fee come on down if you're doing a tv show or a movie we'll fix it up and uh, the only thing i ask is if we get credit as Gold's Gem. Later, very soon after we had a t-shirt, which I never anticipated would sell six shirts, but it sold tremendously. But anyway, um, at that point, I said, you can shoot in the facility if you want to, but you have to wear a Gold's Gem t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> you might have noticed that if you read view Pumping Iron, you'll see that the Gold's Gym t-shirts were everywhere. Everywhere. That was, yeah. That was the same with any production company that came yeah. in. Yeah, that's free publicity. It's, it's a really smart. Exactly. <laughs> International publicity. Yeah. How do you beat it? You can't. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Pumping Iron was shot there. The, the book first. And I told Butler, sure, come on in. Do what you want. I film our uh, stills. And then later, to answer your question, I knew how to entice them to use Gold's as the only gym on the West Coast mm -hmm. because of the lighting. I knew how to fix the lighting to make it advantageous. All they would have to come in to film would be to throw the switch, lights came on, and they're ready to go. And yep. since it's a documentary and they wanted to follow people, it worked. It worked. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to pumping iron in, in a few minutes, but um, thanks for clearing that up as well. Um, now, you just didn't acquire the Gold's Gym, as you mentioned. There was more real estate. Um, is that correct? That's correct. The gym had a building, which Joe Gold had originally built. Mm -hmm. uh, and next door, there was a small house. And next door to that, there was an empty lot and a half. Mm -hmm that uh, should have gone with the house, but were, were uh, purchased separately, all as part of the original package. And uh, again, I don't understand why in the heck other people didn't snap that up. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm assuming you were making uh, also money from the extra lots. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There from the house next door. Then I took it over and put the gym manager when they changed in that house, give them a place to live. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I also um, have read, don't know if this is true. Again, another rumor I wish to address 
Um, was it true that you also acquired a soundstage in Hollywood? Yeah, I had, uh, and that that's another reason I could understand what the needs were of pumping iron. Mm -hmm. I uh, had one of the best commercial production houses, 42 foot high soundstage with what's called a cyclorama. It's like a paper coming out, so you have no background to a photo. But uh, we shot uh, major product commercials on there, major car commercials, uh, TV shows, the President series, uh, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And um, that, uh, I eventually sold that. I just, again, too much work, too much on my plate. <laughs> so that had to go. But yes, I did own a, a soundstage. This is interesting to me. <laughs> to me, it's interesting. It was a soundstage a block away from where Donna grew up, my wife. Oh, wow. Okay. But I never, never met her. <laughs> yeah, sometimes things just point you in the right direction, don't they? That's right. It just I don't I don't believe in destiny, but if there is, this was it. <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry, I have to go back to the soundstage. I um, mean, sure. Um. I'm assuming you probably know the question that's coming up. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, but um, is it true that you also initially used the stage to make um, sex films? Is that true? Or no, it is. It no. is not true. I made a film with uh, a major motion picture out of that sound stage uh, okay. called "So Long, Blue Boy." I don't know if you've ever seen the film Brokeback Mountain? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> okay. It had a similar, not quite as wild theme. Mm -hmm. I produced that, that film there, and I think that's where that rumor got started. Well, I've, I've, I've read it that um, there were films with some bodybuilders in them that were obviously gay films. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about them. I do. It was not shot there. <laughs> um, Sorry? It was not filmed. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 But did you produce these films at all? I did one. Uh huh. Uh, so I will say film. Mm -hmm. And that was earlier. Uh, okay. At, uh, I think I mentioned that film to you in a writing oh. i'm not sure but either way yes okay one and i thought no no more of this as a matter of fact i own i used to try to control everything and so with that film i exhibited it at a private theater mm -hmm. which i also leased out leased um at least it specifically for that film and as far as the major motion picture which was uh, exhibited, I did a test run at the Egyptian theater in Hollywood, on Hollywood yeah. Boulevard. And uh, I could see that the public wasn't quite ready for it, the general public. So I pulled that from distribution. Little loss, but better a little loss than a big loss trying to drive home a point. <laughs> yes. So, um, and that was all under Dakota Productions, is that correct? You know, I'm trying, the one film was, the one yeah. film was. Oh, okay. But the yeah. rest of your, your films, the rest of the commercials and, and all the other stuff you did, was that under another different name then? Oh, yeah. Okay, yes. yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just there, trying to gather. Yeah, there's no way of crossing that, that bridge. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, it's easier to let that go and start something new. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm just trying to gather in my mind, all the resources that led to not just the purchase of Gold's Gym, but um, its 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 growth, which you obviously propagated. That's why I'm asking these questions. Um, yeah, and yeah. Well, um, now, let me give you something. It's also probably not very well known, but all it took me out of pocket pocket cash was fifteen thousand dollars to buy Gold's and all that land. 
because I structured it in such a way, maybe it wasn't obvious to other people that were interested in purchasing it, but I structured it in such a way, Danit's got $15,000. I got 100% of the stock in Gold's Gym, Inc., which owned all the land and buildings. So I was essentially purchasing stock, which drove Joe Gold Jim crazy, incidentally, because he was trying to horn in to somehow pull a little money out of it. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, you know, that's the life, right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I got the gym that way. So we're talking $15,000. Now, I assumed another, I think, around $55,000 in uh, mortgages, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And very quickly, the gym business paid for the whole thing. Yeah. So there's very little, you know, cash flow problem. <laughs> so as we have heard from Ken Sprague, it was through his financial security that he was able to purchase Gold's Gym and save it from extinction. This would be yet another ambitious but wise decision that would yield him great financial success and make Gold's Gym the household name that it would become. As Ken Sprague explains, the fact that he could sneak into Gold's gym for his first training session and evade Zabo Kazewski was a true reflection of how the gym was run and why it was a financial disaster. Jerry Brainham told me that Zabo was called the chief because he was the chief of nothing and although he was an accomplished bodybuilder, he was not very good at managing Gold's gym. Joe Gold, who established Gold's gym, owned it for four to five years between 1965 and 1970, by which time it was losing money. Danet, an antique dealer, and Dave Sachs purchased Gold's and owned it for a little over two years between 1970 and 1972. Ken Sprague, who saw its potential and loved bodybuilding, bought it in 1972 and transformed it into the mecca of bodybuilding with the help of Ken Waller. As opposed to Irvin Zabo Kazewski, Ken Waller was responsible and Ken Sprague knew he could trust Ken Waller to manage the gym well and way better than Zabo. At the time, mind you, bodybuilding was still relatively unknown to the public. Bodybuilders in the California scene were mostly beach bums and barely survived, earned next to nothing in terms of salary and gyms in general were not money-making businesses, especially those that were hardcore bodybuilding gyms like Gold's Gym. Vince's gym was well known in Hollywood, so Vince Gironda did quite well at Vince's gym and as he had actors training in his gym. Bill Pearl's gym also did very well, but Gold's wasn't the household name it would later become with Ken Sprague's influence. Ken's financial situation obviously helped in the acquisition of Gold's, and the fact that he was heavily connected in Hollywood helped further in promoting the name Gold's Gym and its association to bodybuilding in the golden years. He ensured that Joe Weider's magazine, mainly Muscle Builder, would shoot at Gold's Gym. When shows or movies needed a gym scene, Ken would have producers come down and shoot at Gold's Gym, and actors would have to wear a Gold's Gym t-shirt to help in the publicity of Gold's Gym. Pumping Iron was shot there too, and with his experience, he helped make the film successful. If you haven't watched the film Dream Big, I recommend you do. I recently reviewed this film as it is the most accurate documentary on how Gold's Gym became successful, and Ken Sprague, along with Ken Waller, Bill Grant, Pete Grimkowski, Franco Colombo, and countless others are interviewed, documenting the stories that helped Gold's Gym become a household name. So I do hope you have enjoyed this video interview with Ken Sprague explaining how Gold's Gym became the mecca of bodybuilding. If you have, please give the video a like, subscribe and leave me your comments. A quick thanks to all my supporters so far as by the time this video is released, I should have reached 90,000 followers and we are definitely getting close to the magic 100,000. In the next video interview with Ken Sprague, Ken explains how it was like training at Gold's Gym during the golden years. And following, we will explore the steroid scene at Gold's Gym and look at the real steroid cycles used by bodybuilders at Gold's Gym. So stay tuned. 
Soon after, I will release my interview series with Ken Waller for those who have been asking. That's it from me. This is the Golden Era Bookworm saying bye for now. Head to www.goldenerabookworm.com for the biggest range of classic old school bodybuilding books as ebooks, e magazines such as Iron Man and Reg Park Journal, high quality bodybuilding posters of the Golden Era stars, merchandise, and classic gym wear featuring Steve Reeves, Marvin Eda, John Grimmick, Reg Park, and many other Golden Era stars. For those wishing to build a classic physique, lose fat, and build muscle, Online training is also available. Collectibles such as rare autographed photos from the Golden Era stars are also available. And to collaborate, please get in touch. As a natural bodybuilder, it is imperative to know your own testosterone levels as they are a reflection of the anabolic environment created by your diet and training. I would highly recommend using the male hormone test kit from Let's Get Checked and make sure you use my code GOLDEN30 for a 30% discount. Again, the advantage of checking yourself regularly is that you will know how well your body is anabolically primed to put on the much desired muscle you are working for. Not all of us have the time to go to a gym or the opportunity to have a coach to teach us one-on-one. -on -one. But with the Future Fitness app, it's like having a personal trainer in your living room. From February 11th onwards, you can try the Future Fitness app for only $19 for the first month. Think of what you can accomplish during that first month. So go on and hit my link at tryfuture.co slash geb to get started. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Vince Deronda's approach to bodybuilding, his principles, and all these tips of wisdom that he has. But to be honest, these three books, I believe, which I call the classic physique bundle, are the best books that Vince ever came out with. And they, of course, are the Wild Physique, the Master Series, and the Pro Series. Have a look at it this way. The Wild Physique, I believe, is like the ABCs of Vince Gironda's principles to bodybuilding. He teaches you the exercises and his principles, but how do you put them together? Well, the Master Series is a 14-month program of using all of these principles, all of the diets that Vince came out with, all of the exercises, and of course, the Pro Series was a book that he came out with later on, specially targeted for uh, getting into competition. It's just these, these three books, as I call it, the classic physique bundle, uh, Vince's best work, and available, of course, at www.goldenerabookum.com.